Thank you. All right, thank you everybody and welcome to the uh, speaker panel. I will be your host. <laughs> uh, you know, I've been thinking about this actually long and hard for about a year because um, for the past few years we've been doing the speaker panel in, in I guess, the traditional way. And um, I had a, a bit of a, a revelation last time uh, when, when Dr. Joe Dispenza came to record the course in May, uh, where we just had dinner one night, and it was the most fascinating conversation. And I'm sure that you could have been in the audience here, there, and I've, I've loved uh, to, to witness that event, but unfortunately we were just a few people at a dinner table uh, joking and laughing about quantum catering and, you know, uh, Schrollinger's lobster, and, and it was actually, um, it, it made me think that a speaker panel really should be a conversation. Because you're looking at a, a panel of esteemed leaders and speakers and, and thinkers and writers and, and scientists, and, and these are some of the greatest minds in the world, and now they're all there, and they can speak to each other and elevate the conversation to a, 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 diff, a, a, a level that is uh, unimaginable that we can't even think of. So what I did is I prepared a small PowerPoint presentation to really set the mood for the conversation. And uh, Noah, if you could bring that up, please. So I, how many people have read the Celestine Prophecy? All right, good. Uh, that's more than half. Um, nice adventure book. It's like an enlightenment story. But there is a specific point in the story that they talk about... Um, uh, sharing or, or emphasizing uh, energy, and um, it, it's 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 um, what I wanted. What I got from that is that when you're two people connected together, and that you're having a conversation, you you take that information in of the other person listening. All that energy, you're grabbing it in, and then you send it back at that person, and that person does the same thing. It takes that energy of the conversation, amplifies it, and then sends it back to you. And the result of that is a wonderful conversation. And so I, I prepared a short little film. Actually, it's a it's a book, but it also was turned into a movie. And I I made a uh, well, I mean I. I, I clipped out a, a small portion of the video just to demonstrate that. Now, if you can, there you go. And if you could hit play. Wait a minute. Hmm. Maybe we're misreading this. Father Sanchez, John, come here. I found something in the translations. Look at this. This phrase, "Biruta mozim maita." What does it mean? It means roughly to amplify. Hmm. I thought it just referred to one person giving energy to another. But now I think it's something more. It's one thing to just give energy. But if we give it to someone who is also giving it back, then we build energy among ourselves. It amplifies back and forth. It says if we were all doing this, humanity would take another step in evolution. So I, wa I wanted to show this clip to visualize what I was trying to explain. In, in another book that comes after the Celestine Prophecy, which is called The Tenth Insight, they talk about this book for a group. And what they talk with the group is that this exact exchange of information can get even stronger. And it's like if the energy goes from one person and elevates itself and reaches ideas that we've never reached before. And this is what I'd like to do with the speaker panel. And so, you know, so this is the, the, the exact thing. And with, you know, what I also then wanted to do is make sure that it's a simple conversation. And here's the example that... Noah, could you just go to the next slide, <laughs> please? All right. This is the view. Now, most people know what the view is. It's a popular morning TV time show, and they discuss all sorts of uh, normal pop idea. They, all they do is they sit around, they talk about pop culture, and that's it. And they just have a simple conversation. And so, uh, could you go to the next slide, please, Noah? So. That's the view, and Noah, please. This is the quantum view.
All right, Noah, you can come back to the, the, the main shot of all of us. So with that said, what I wanted to do is since it's in this theme of the view, I wanted to start with something extremely simple, but yet it's something I've recognized from a lot of the speakers I've talked about. And uh, I will talk about pop culture and I will talk about Angelina Jolie and what has come out in the news recently. And somehow I'm sure that these people have a lot to say about that because it's not just a pop culture story, it's about epigenetics and it's about genes. And, it, and so I, I, I will leave it up to our panel and uh, please have um, a conversation. Let me ask this question. If, you, if Angelina Jolie would have come to you uh, for uh, advice, what would you have told her? I'll start with my father, please. I did not have any reversal, practice. No, <laughs> and, no. And since uh, maybe two months to uh, three months, he said, you know, you should write about Angelina Jolie's story and, you know, you should speak about it. I said, no, no, I don't want to touch this subject. <laughs> and then uh, the other day on Quantum World TV, Dr. Goswami came along and he started to speak about Angelina Jolie. And I said a few words yesterday too because he was the first to initiate the conversation. And, and what I said is, uh, in some way, this is the expression of the failure of the medicine. You know, when, when the, the top, because you can imagine what, with her problem, she probably consult the top in, in the field of this uh, uh, model of uh, materialistic medicine. And they came with the conclusion that, you know, mastectomy was a treatment. So when a, a, a model of medicine, you know, come with this uh, approach as uh, the mastectomy as the, the, the therapy is, it, it, it's, it, it's an admission of absu absolutely a, a failure. So this is what I saw and it was sad because in some way this is not what the press and, and her story revealed. It's like, oh yes, she's so courageous and to go to this and her kids. So uh, of course we have another point of view when we start to look at the, the gene DNA uh, from the quantum medicine point of view. Uh, what I would have said to her, and I know she probably open to different, I know she's very liberal, right? She's open to all type of experience. Uh, the idea will have probably tried to shift her awareness about, you know, how she perceived herself. Because if she, if she went for that option, option, she didn't see other possibility that can happen for her. She didn't have this awareness that uh, we are in touch with, this awareness that you know, DNA can be a change to your thinking, to your thought, to your experience. Uh, I was sitting in the class this morning with uh, Dr. Dispenza. You know, when you go in this state of alter uh, expansion of consciousness, this is how, this, this is where you start to see other possibilities. So I will probably no, not go on the, uh, by the trying to argue with her or trying to, uh, because she, she done that is because she was in fear. She's in fear because in her family history, uh, her mother died from a, a cancer. And she probably looked at her mother and the whole path she went through and all this chemotherapy. And, and this is what this, you know, envision that has probably triggered and enhanced the fear in her. So you have to absolutely disamorse that. And this is not in a conversation, you know, arguing with her, it's bringing her uh, in, a, in, a, in an experience. I would probably, uh, I would probably suggest her to go to uh, one of the workshops of Dr. <laughs> Dispenza. <laughs> and what do you think, Dr. Dispenza, about this? Well, <clears throat> the epigenetic model of reality tells us that genes do not determine disease. That's what it says, that when Watson and Crick, you know, did their experiments on, on um, discovering the, 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 the blueprint of life, they created a paper and it became known as the central dogma that said that genes create disease. Well, there were so many papers written against that prophecy, against that point of view, but it was mostly shoved under the carpet. So if you were to take out one cell of your body and string the DNA out from end to end, <clears throat> it would be six feet tall. If you took out all the DNA out of everybody on the planet and you strung their DNA out from end to end, it would go way past the sun and back over 150 times. 
The DNA, if you scrunched it all together, it would fit in a grain of rice. So it's a very etheric particle if you looked at everybody's DNA. Now, when they were mapping the human genome, they said the body makes about 100,000 different proteins. And it takes about 40,000 different proteins to make those proteins. So the body has about 140,000 proteins. So there should be 140,000 genes to make 140,000 proteins. Does that make sense? Because your body's a protein producing machine. And a gene is turned on or, or activated, and it, the function of it is to make proteins. Well, when they mapped the human genome, they found out that we only express about 23,000 genes. So we have more protein in our bodies than genes to make them. So genes aren't the end of the story. In fact, if you start studying epigenetics, in one sequence of genes, there can be 35,000 different combinations on the same gene. So now you're creating different proteins from the same template. And it's combinations of genetic expression that begins to produce proteins. So it's not a one-to-one -one linear process. So because you carry the gene for leadership or religious uh, uh, propensity or or Alzheimer's doesn't mean that the gene is signaled yet, that the epigenetic model says that some influence outside of the cell has to signal the gene to cause the gene to upregulate or to downregulate. When it upregulates, what it does is it, it, it selects a, a different protein expression. When it downregulates, it turns off genes for protein expression. So imagine the DNA in the, in the cell of a body like a Christmas tree, lights. And certain ones are turning on and other ones are turning off. But if the information that's coming from outside the cell, based on a person's attitude, their emotions, their, their lifestyle, toxins, trauma, doesn't matter, it's the redundancy of that same signal that carries a very strong um, a quotient that begins to downregulate the genes and you begin to create disease. So just because you have a, 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 a genetic propensity doesn't necessarily mean that the gene is expressed yet. Does that make sense? So Dean Ornish, as an example, took a group of men that were low-risk prostatic uh, cancer patients that had the gene propensity. And all he did for less than three months was he had them think differently he had them move differently, and he had them make different choices in terms of things they ate. And in three months, they upregulated 48 different genes that suppressed the tumor, and they activated about 400 different genes that promoted the immune system and health. And so genes can turn on and off based on the information that comes from, the, from outside of the cell. But if the person is perceiving and living their life from the same level of mind every day and reacting to the same conditions, there's no new information for the cell, and now we're headed for our genetic destiny. So my answer would have been simply, just because you have the propensity or the gene doesn't mean it's expressed yet. And if you make the right type of choices, there's a good possibility you could live your life cancer-free. Because if she believes that her mother died of cancer and she will die of cancer. That belief is strong enough to signal the gene. So how do you change a belief or a perception? Well, that's a whole other story, but at least people begin to realize that the media is really creating a very strong um, degree of misinformation when people start to realize because they have a gene for this or a gene for that, that that's their destiny. It's absolutely not the truth. Dr. Goswami. Well, um, let's go a little bit further with it. <laughs> <laughs> so if we bring in our knowledge of quantum and consciousness, then um, the situation changes once more and towards more positive uh, outlook. This was actually my point that I made in that interview, which is that what a sad thing that the media, and especially media can be excused because media is just an uneducated conduit for the established opinion. Um, <laughs> it, but no such excuses exist for the oncologist. No such excuses exist for the academe 
who regularly teaches just scientific materialism, and not only that, actively leaves out everything that goes behind it. Uh, so, uh, could you get closer to the microphone, please? Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So, um, what is quantum physics saying? Quantum physics, from the get-go, has said something that uh, turns you around in your belief that genes or anything in space-time can be absolute. Because it, from the beginning, has said that there is a domain of possibilities and a domain of actuality, wave and particle. Now, mind you, this is just basic quantum. No controversy here. Experimentally, people have tried and tried and tried to interpret things otherwise, but experimentally, it, it's just absolutely clear, 100% accepted that, yes, there are two domains of reality. So what is the meaning of the second domain of reality? Now, this is this thing that people fight about a little bit. But again, even for Heisenberg, it was clear that this domain is domain of consciousness because the change that happens in the wave function collapse, I'll use a little sophisticated language because you are a sophisticated audience, uh, wave function collapse is a change in the knowledge. Uh, um, you know, it's a change in the knowledge about the, about the object. So if our knowledge is involved, everybody knows, even etymologically, the vehicle for knowledge is consciousness, Consciousness is our way of knowing, so consciousness is involved. So we immediately get to the idea that Dr. Joe just said, that, look, take the information of epigenetics, that this gene's turning off, turning on, and we can change it. We can change it, why? Because consciousness chooses from the possibilities of healing. Now, here is a great lady, Angelina Jolie. She became very afraid, of course, very nervous about her children, and therefore made a huge sacrifice to herself. All that is true. But if she knew, if she knew, then couldn't this bravery be far more effective than any ordinary one of us, and she could use this bravery to initiate a program for herself, which could easily choose what is healing possibility for her. And this is even without going into the details of creative process. Today we know the creative process. We know how to choose. And we know that uh, a person who becomes dedicated to uh, healing herself or himself out of such a predicament as a genetic predisposition, no denying the predisposition. Ah, simple answer. So if, 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 if this knowledge was available, then uh, things might have been different. So we should, uh, you know, when, when I was at this um, interview, um, they were all a little impressed, the people present, that I would even use this example. Um, but really, um, my point basically is that all of us, what all of us are doing at this conference is the same thing. We got to take this knowledge to the public at large so that the alternatives are available. Ignorance is the worst thing that happens to a society. And if a segment of society is absolutely determined to perpetuate on ignorance, that's their choice, their privilege. You cannot do anything about that. But you can work on the people who are just ignorant because they don't get the information. So it is imperative that all of you become emissaries. We have emphasized this before. This is what our students are. They are emissaries of the new knowledge in the medical field and eventually in all fields, that we have other choices. We are not determined beings. The human 
medicine system is different from a machine medicine system. Okay, that would be my take on it. I'm sure that it's a situation where Angela Jolie thought about that 24-7. If you remember the discussion that we had the other day where I was talking about thought. Thought is information and energy. And so here she is thinking about this and having wanted or unwanted thoughts really wouldn't matter which direction it was going, but what happens? And she has a thought, wanted or unwanted, she holds that for 17 seconds, and that begins to call forward other energy that is like that. And as she holds that for 17 seconds, what happens? More energy. And so this goes on hour after hour, day after day, month after month, and what happens? The momentum. So she has a momentum going in a different direction, but without the knowledge of being able to stop the momentum, step back from it and say, wait a minute, I have some other choices here. And look at those to change the momentum of the quantum physics, other areas of possibility. She chose one possibility and stayed with it. Would she have made a different choice if she simply had been knowledgeable enough, informed enough that there were other choices? How many of us get into that situation where we get into one paradigm? And that is the only paradigm, that's the only option. And we're not looking at the observer effect of looking at what at all possibilities. All things are possible. And it's about commanding the power of thought. Dr. Farrell, thanks. I don't know what I would have said. I really don't. Um, Now, the, the reason being that we make our choices out of, obviously, from fear or from love. They're both, they're both very strong positions. Unfortunately, today, we have to do a lot of our own work to come to a truth other than what's considered the mainstream truth by medicine. You know, uh, what, what happens when we remove the tumor is that we remove the symptom. And we act surprised when it, the cancer comes back within five years because we didn't rebalance the system. We didn't rebalance our consciousness, our thought process. Um, it's very easy to step into fear. It's really up to us to be changing the next, gen the next generations of what medicine is out there teaching. In a sense, and I don't want to speak about Angeline Jolie specifically because I, I just don't think it's appropriate, even though she placed herself in the public eye with it out of choice. But let's just say in general, it's sort of, our fault that she didn't have the support she needed. The awareness that enough of us haven't yet fully permeated and changed the consciousness and the teachings of mainstream medicine. And of course, hopefully, the teachings of the people that you have here before you and what you take in to the practices that you'll be working with will bring about greater opportunity for people to access greater awareness and make choices based on their being at effect rather than at cause. It's very easy 
to live in fear, make the right choice on the outside, but still have the fear on the inside, then turn around and say, and be right. Say, see, it didn't work. I would never tell her what to do. Couldn't tell her what to do. Don't know exactly what I would do in that situation. I know what I would like to do. I know what I would like to say. I would do, don't know what I would do. I have to tell you, I think that the greatest gift of this whole discussion so far right now on this panel might not be the information that was offered by any of us as speakers. The greatest gift might be the question that you, Alexei, asked because you really got us to start to seek for answers. And I don't know that our growth comes so much from the answers themselves as it comes from the actual seeking of the answers. So uh, as fascinating as all of this is, Alexei, I thank you for the question. Well, thank you. I'll, sure. I'll take that. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. And so I, I so I have an, I, an yeah, I'd like to add something. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, because I, I can remember I was uh, sitting this kind, as a physician in this situation many times, where a woman would come to me and was in this, you know, uh, crossroad where she was diagnosed breast cancer. Because I practiced medicine, as you know, in Canada for many years. I was in that chair. And this woman would come to me. And some were in fear, of course, because they knew other of their friend or that they went through this process and they, they know about chemotherapy and who want to go in that direction. So the first thing I will do with them, and most of the time, of course, when we're in the mode of fear, which is narrow our possibility and choice, <coughs> You know, we won't answer. So they all the time ask, you know, what you will do. So you cannot answer that question for them. So I would sit with them and try to gather as much information I could so that they could have the, the, the possibility of choice. And then as if, you have, as if I am a medical doctor, of course I have all the information about the lab and the diagnostic. But as an integrative doctor, I will also do the blood analysis. I will do the Kirlian photography, vol electroacupuncture. I will try to <coughs> uh, mirror them where they are at that moment, what kind of resource they have. A and, and from there, you know, where kind of path they can choose. And for me, this, that was a very precious moment. First of all, we, we spoke about this during the, this week, you know, you have to listen. You have to listen at them. I would probably have listened at Angela Jolie because her fear and her history with her mother is obvious. But then instead to jump on a choice, you try to give them an awareness of where they are. But that picture, this portrait has to be as, you know, the most global it is. And this is why I'm speaking about a kind of evaluation that reflects these parameters. You know, that tell you, you know, what, how is the energetic body? What, what is the life force there? Because sometimes, you know, this, they think, you know, going the natural path is an easy choice. No, it's not an easy choice. A and I have stories of women who went that path and have friends, I have re written book, you know, and they, they, they cure their cancer going through that path. And you know that most of the time they have to change their their way of thinking and eating and, and so it's not necessarily an easy path and there, you need some kind of resource to go that way. So the first step was to give them as much information they could. And then of course later on I realized that these, these, uh, <coughs> this doctor doesn't exist in society. You know, most of the time they go to see one that just reflects a part of it. And then this is where come the collective consciousness that we're speaking, what he's speaking about, you know. This is what we are growing today, you know. This is the kind of, of doctor tomorrow you will be because you will have this information where you can reflect, you know, a, a deeper 
a, a portrait of what, what are the choices. And sometimes I will tell you, the choice was for this woman is not all the time the natural one. Sometimes it was also the medical one because resources were limited. But of course, if you compound this with, you know, a growing process and a support where the real problem and <coughs> is also uh, uh, and, uh, solved, you know, so, so it's, you, you, can, you cannot know. Because I saw women going the natural path and they healed and some they, they went this path and they didn't. And the other way, medical was able to solve also. So it's not that easy. You cannot have the answer. So hopefully I... Yeah. Anybody else? So like thank you. Oh. Yeah. You know, where do I go? Oh, testing, there I am. <laughs> I think just in simple form, if we think about everything coming from either love or fear. Someone asked me a question yesterday, what is love? And, and I really had to think about it. We are each love. We are each existing. We are each presence. Love is presence. Fear is really the fear of not being loved, of not being love, of not existing, of not being present. And in the case of Angelina Jolie, she really had to deal with the biggest perceived risk of fear, the greatest challenge between fear and love, which is to exist, to be present, or to potentially not exist and not be present. And I believe that when we step into our consciousness of presence, we step into all of our possibilities, including our potential. When we focus on the fear of not existing, it's, it's almost like focusing on a wavelength that becomes a particle of that one picture, and that's all we allow ourselves to see. Uh, and oh. go ahead. All I was going to, and I was just, oh, all right. I, I just wanted to say it's, um, it's actually really interesting because you start to answer my next question. Uh, so it's a beautiful transition that I, actually it's a simple question that I, that I received that I feel is, uh, is so simple that it, it, it's to the point. And it's what role does love play in the healing process? And that was seriously what I was going to ask. And, and Dr. Pearl just... There you go. <laughs> but... Uh, you know, I'll start down, please, Dr. Dispenza. What does role, uh, what does what role does love play in the healing process? <clears throat> when um, I studied spontaneous remissions from disease, and um, made a very concerted effort to see if we were able to reproduce the same type of effects in people. In other words, if I knew what people had done to get well. Uh, would we be able to reproduce it and see if it was a scientific law? And one of the things when I started studying the remissions from disease and the work that we're doing now, almost every single person had this commonality uh, in healing themselves from all different types of genetic conditions, that they had struggled so hard to overcome the disease like it was the disease that they were overcoming. But when they finally overcame some aspect of themselves, you know, they transmuted fear into courage or love. There came a moment where they all said the same thing. There was a shift in my state where I was no longer worried about the future any longer. <clears throat> I was happy with myself. I was happy with in the present moment. <clears throat> and all of a sudden I was whole and complete. And when they got to that point of being so no longer obsessive or compulsive about focusing on the worst case scenario, because by focusing on that worst case scenario, they're literally choosing a potential in the quantum field. And that probability is becoming a reality because they're emotionally embracing it. And when you get mind and body working like that, for the most part, you're changing your body by thought alone. So when they finally got to the point where they had worked on changing a belief, changing some fear, changing some self-limitation, 
the side effect of that is true wholeness and true love, where you're satisfied in the moment, you're present in the moment, and that's kind of the state of receivership. That's where you feel thankful to be alive for no reason, and you're no longer relying on the things outside of you to bring you pleasure or bring you joy. Somehow it's coming from within you. And so I've studied some of this and saw that the best word to describe all of that is self-love, that there comes a moment where you feel humbled and great at the same time, and you feel so present and so happy in the moment that you go from being selfish, you know, focused on the self and the worst case scenario and people and problems, to being selfless. All of a sudden, you feel so lifted and so joyful that the only thing you want to do is give because you want everybody to feel the way you feel. And that selfless state, to me, is emulating the divine. It's emulating the creator. And that's when that invisible force that's giving us life begins to move in us and move through us. And so if a person is thinking and feeling in the same cycle for years on end, the neurotransmitters in their brain are creating neuropeptides, and those neuropeptides are signaling hormonal centers, and those hormonal centers are causing them to feel a certain level of consciousness. And so if you're living in survival or you're living in stress, the lower centers of hormones in your body have everything to do with your sexual identity, have everything to do with your digestion and, 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 and your exertion of power and control in your life. But when you have a unity of polarity, when you're no longer male or female, you're no longer past or future, good or bad, or success or failure, that unity of polarities is what I call love. And that energy all of a sudden leaves those centers and it moves into your heart and you start experiencing a greater sense of self. You feel connected to something greater. You feel whole. You feel complete. And I think that when you're in the present moment, and you feel that way, and yet at the same time you can see a future, but you're not obsessing about how it's going to happen or when it's going to happen. You're beyond that level of analysis. I think there's a whole reorganization that happens biologically in the body, and it is that change in neuropeptides and oxytocin and all the wonderful chemicals that are created that cause the body to move back into homeostasis. And by very nature of, say, example, oxytocin, it suppresses all of the circuits in the amygdala that have to do with anxiety and fear. It suppresses the selfish emotions of hostility and anger, of guilt and sadness. They're all suppressed in the amygdala, and the only thing that's left is this joy and this expansion and, and being in love with life. And that consciousness carries a different level of frequency, and all frequency carries information. So in a matter of seconds, biology is rewritten to a new mind, or consciousness is rewriting biology in that second. So when we get to that point where we're in love with life and ourselves, not looking for pleasure or not looking for something outside of us, but really facing ourselves and, really tr and taking it to the next level, I think that's when uh, we start to see self-love born. And I think that a lot of people confuse pleasure and love, and they're really not the same thing. Pleasure you know, has everything to do with using something outside of you to make you feel good for a moment. But self-love is really when you start really making your way and, and changing yourself from the inside, when you don't see possibility and you're fighting against yourself and you continue that journey across the river of change and there's nobody in your life that you can relate with in that moment, but you're courageous enough to continue that your body as the mind is bucking and kicking and telling you you can't and you're transmuting that doubt into something greater. The moment the body liberates that energy, the breaking of those emotional addictions driven by those survival emotions is called joy. Joy is the absence of those attachments and addictions. And the body's liberating energy. You go from particle to wave, frequency is enhanced, and all of a sudden now, you're happy to be alive. And it is that state of being that then, of course, brings life to us. So in, in me just observing just effects of people having remissions from disease, it's one of the common things I notice is that people moved into that state of grace, into that state of love, and they were no longer so preoccupied by the, the worst case scenario in their future. They were happy in the present moment. And that somehow really reorganized their state of being.
Do Dr. Goswami. Well said. <laughs> <laughs> but now let's convert it to even more direct, <laughs> proactive approach to what we can actually do. The basic problem is well stated now. Fear is a problem. Negative emotions are a problem. Uh, so these are uh, producers at the material level, certain conjunctions of molecules, brain circuits, behavior coming from it that Dr. Joe has explained wonderfully. But uh, that's at a level where, which is removed from us. We are not particularly uh, sensitive to that level, however much we try. It, it, it's detached from us a little for good reasons. Um, we are aware of things, uh, subtle things, that happen. We are aware about certain changes in mind. We are aware about feelings. We are about, aware about our experiences. The problem with changing uh, the negative aspects of us into positive aspects of us is that the negative aspects mostly are already situated in the body, in the brain, uh, as a result of evolution. The positive aspects of us, as the wisdom, ancient wisdom tells more or less accurately, are whispers of angels. We call them intuitions. So yes, love, but to be in love in the present moment uh, remains just a wisp of desire or wishful thinking uh, until we figure out how, what to do, a proactive approach to it. So is such an approach available? Yes, it is available, because we now know that we choose uh, in a consciousness that is ordinarily beyond us, but there is a pathway, road to that consciousness called creative process. So we can use the creative process to get us to make these whispers of angels into much stronger experiences that Dr. Joe was talking about, which comes spontaneously to people, of course, and spontaneous healing is now well established, but we can make them come to us through the creative process, and some people already have done that. So what we do is just go through a, an amplifying process using uh, intentions a lot, using our positive attitudes a lot, and staying within that creative process, create that insight, that encounter, in which the huge amount of mental block of these vital energies can be removed, literally. And at that moment, all those molecular changes that Dr. Joe just talked about take place. So the molecular changes are not being caused by the body. That's the mistake to think. It's actually we creating the new reality. More we recognize that, yes, it is always we creating the more of that new reality and not the body creating anything. In other words, when we didn't understand it, we had certain languages, and doctors are very cautious in using, continuing to use that language because that language is not criticized by the conventional medicine people, which is that body has wisdom. Well, translate body as consciousness. We have wisdom in our higher consciousness. So it's all a matter of, do I have the capacity of accessing this other realm that quantum physics has been telling us from the get-go, the realm of possibility, the realm of potentiality? Can we access it in a systematic manner using a proactive process to really make things happen? There is no guarantee in this. So there is, uh, the process here is very different. The creative process is very different than other kinds of processes with which you're familiar with. 
that's, of course, a little bit disconcerting in the beginning. But then you get the hang of it, and then you recognize that, aha, this is a fun process, because this is the whole nature of the difference between fear and love. Fear is control, but love is no control. So can we have an outcome out of love? Can we control without control? This is the whole trick of the thing. We are so used to establishing things when we have control, which is what brings us subject to negativity. We never realize that when we relax the control, there is control. I'll give you a simple example. In relationships at our home, we have some fear relationships. The husband is so afraid of wife's wrath that he goes home right after work. He doesn't hang around with his buddies having a beer. But isn't it also possible, and doesn't it happen quite frequently, that the husband goes to the bar and has a beer and then becomes aware, oh, I promised my wife. And just simply out of love, that no, I would like to spend the time with her, and I promised her anyway, so goes home. See the control coming from love, too. We forget that. We constantly live with control coming from love as well, which is no control at all. Simply the awareness that I care. So it's not that hard to go from the fear dynamic to the dynamics of love. But it's not that easy either. It's not just uh, wishful thinking that, okay, I'll be in the present moment, and that is love, and being in the past, being in the future is fear. It's not that simple. But it's not that hard either, okay? <laughs> well, <laughs> well said. It's all the time difficult to speak up after these. Uh, but let's add a, a French touch. <laughs> 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 because some think that God speak in quantum physics, and others think God speak in mathematics. But actually, God speak in French. You know that. <laughs> <laughs> because well, Fre from, from, from Quebec. <laughs> from Quebec with with a French Quebec accent. <laughs> because French is the language of love. <laughs> I saw all the time the, the, uh, as a healer, doctor, practitioner, I saw it as a really a great privilege. Because I think it's probably the, the, the most beautiful uh, profession in the world, or career, of action. Why? Because this is about loving others and learn about love. And if I look my journey, this is what has been about. You know, if I look at this great moment I had in this, you know, journey of trying to understand how how works, you know, the 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 first, of course, the the mechanic of the body, but not to this more subtle than this. Learn all these notion of uh, subtlety, subtle energy, and contemplate the movement of that. You know, in this. Uh, refinement of, of quantum uh, of the quantum world has been absolutely a uh, great joy moment of ec ecstasy and it's still like that and when I start to do my practice uh, as a medical doctor at the beginning I was when the client will walk in for me it was like opening a book you know like you read a history because everyone will come with of course a journey of pain or an all kind of event and then so just to be sitting there and listening at that story was, was a moment of, you know, where you, ex because love is about exchange, it's about communion. It's about, and Dr. Dispenza was speaking about this oxytocin, but this more and more you, you dive in this experience of healing, more and more you bound, you bound with another individual, you bound with yourself and, and, and the whole universe. So, uh, to make it short is the, this a story to have been a, a healer and a doctor and exploring all the dimension has for me 
been the journey where I learned about love. And, and if I am now I'm preparing, uh, trying to put a book together, and I look, you know, what has been the trigger of that journey? And the first one was because I, I, I lost my brother. He was uh, 17 and he was 18 from a, a osteosarcoma of the skull. And that has been the trigger, you know, try to understand pain and suffering. And then, of course, uh, as I said along the way, you know, the, the tapestry of understanding deepened. And a year ago, uh, my daughter had a, a grandson who, who born prematurely. And he, he brought me even deeper in this layer of experience of love that, you know, is probably the, the, the most beautiful moment of my life. So this is what I sh have to share. Thank you. Years ago, there was a case that was before the Supreme Court, and it made me think about this case as we were listening to the discussion here. And the case that was before the Supreme Court required a great deal of deliberation because the question was one of having to define something. In this case, they were trying to define pornography and one of the Supreme Court justices came back with the discussion about, he said, I can't tell you what pornography is, but I know it when I see it. And I think love is very much the same, not like pornography. <laughs> <laughs> that came out wrong. I want a t-shirt that says that. <laughs> See, we'll I have a made up. <laughs> what the doctor meant to say <laughs> is that love is, is similar in that we know when we don't have it and we know when we experience it. But to be able to define it is very difficult. Love is different things to different people, in different situations, different conditions. From a neuroscience perspective, we, we can identify brain patterns that help us understand things like the lower denser frequencies, anxiety and depression, and you know labels that we have put on that. We also understand that there are vibrations that are higher, faster vibrations, if you remember the, that inverted cone that I showed and had the different frequencies, that it moved from a lower, denser to a more open level of consciousness. And so in some of the research that we did, looking at that, that whole brain state being that gateway to higher consciousness, that when we are more whole-brained, then I believe that we have the opportunity to experience that higher consciousness. So again, it's one of those things where do you know when you have higher consciousness? We can, we can feel that. Many of us in this room have experienced that. We also know when we're not there. That the, the issue really is we are vibrational beings living in a vibrational universe. And it is learning how to control those vibrations to a point where we can be in command of that. That if I want to live in lo love and joy, then what is it that I have to do? I have to, I have to be more whole, more at one, be completely aligned, spirit, mind, and body. I know when I'm out of alignment, and that's part of, part of the process. We need the contrast. The contrast is extremely important. We have to know what we don't want and experience what we don't want in order to know what we do want. And then we put our focus on what we do want. If so, what we want is higher consciousness. And what we want to do is live in love and joy. Then we put our focus and our attention on that, and that becomes our point of attraction. And then we, once we have achieved that point of attraction, then we are vibrating at those higher frequencies we can then begin to influence not only ourselves in living and loving and being in that space, but influencing those around us. And I think that's one of the goals and the missions that we should have, that love is a 
label that we put on it so that we can understand what it is. But more importantly, we need to understand how to get there. And when we're not there, what it is that we can do to change our physical circumstances, our mental circumstances, or our spiritual circumstances in order to make that wholeness what it is, that is the place that we come from. That is the place that we are. That is the being we are. I'm still trying to figure out how to follow love is like pornography. <laughs> Actually, I could tell you that um, because we were speaking about several times it's come up about, you know, particle and wave, particle versus wave, moving from the particle into the wave. And there's actually a new study I heard about this morning that shows that rabbits are the only animals that cannot exist in particle form on any level because they're permanent hair waves. <laughs> Sorry. Anyhow, it takes a second, I know. I want a, bunny I want a t-shirt like that. Yeah. Yes. Bunnies. So. <laughs> you know, I don't consider love as a wistful state or a state that we have to work at. At times, depending on how we view it, we may come at it from that perspective. I know from my experience of, you know, teaching hundreds of thousands of people, from interacting with them at seminars, teaching them reconnective healing, the sessions that I do, the sessions that our, our many practitioners do, that oftentimes, instantaneously, instantaneously, when you interact with this more comprehensive spectrum of energy, light, and information, you enter into a state of love. And when you enter into that state of love, the field of all potential opens up to you, the field of infinite potential. And it is, as we mentioned, in that state, of not being attached to a specific end result, needing to know the how or the why or the when or the where. But in that state of love with infinite potential, when we detach from neediness, that the perfect orchestration of the universe takes over. As Dr. Goswami said, you know, when you let go of control, there's control. I might word it a little bit differently, just to add my own flavor to that. But when, you know, everything, as we talk about, comes from fear, lack, limitation, the illusion of separation, the illusion of darkness, the need for control, even in our energy healing techniques, do step one before step two. Move your hands clockwise, not counterclockwise. Bring this north or east south or west, shake off the negative energy before it gets inside of you, spray yourself with alcohol. It's a need for control, it's very fear-based. And all we can control with is the limitations of our human conscious educated minds, and believe me, there's a lot of limitation there. Perceived and more insidiously what we haven't yet consciously been aware of. But healings don't reside in fear, lack, limitation, the need for control, separation, illusion, darkness, illusion. Healings reside in love, prosperity, abundance, light, oneness, unity, and freedom, the freedom that allows us to let go of the control and to become the witness and the witnessed, the seer and the seen, the observer and the observed, to observe without judgment or direction. And when we truly step out of the way, and that's what stepping out of the way is, entering into that state of love. When we step out of the way, we find that our greatest gift is that we are so honored and privileged 
to be allowed to observe the perfect orchestration of, call it God, call it love, call it the intelligence of the universe. Therein lies healing, not just healing as in getting over something, regaining the use of an arm or a leg or a liver or a kidney, having a brain tumor vanish. But our evolution, which includes changing our potential, allowing that to evolve, not limiting the potential to needing to be odds are a sentence of brain or uh, breast cancer might be passed down to us but to opening us up to the fullness of potential in that state of love. And I don't believe that state of love needs to be worked at. I believe it's a state that we allow ourselves to enter into and we float in that space of limitless potential. And what comes out of it is not controlled or directed by us, but is orchestrated by the beauty of God, love, and the universe. Not that I have an opinion on the subject. <laughs> I, that was uh, beautiful. Thank you very much. Actually, I, I, I'd like to add also a little something because I'm, I'm not a, uh, a great healer or a doctor or a scientist, uh, but I'm an expert at this, and this is love. Um, this entire experience, and, and in fact, it relates a bit what I was talking about earlier, this, this ex exchange of energy between this, these speakers, and also that we are a group. In fact, all of you are sending us the energy right now and are building this conversation to greater heights and experience of love. So I wanted to thank you for that. All right. I... Um, I see this about half time, so I will change the order around. I will start with Dr. Pearl. Oh, great. And um, <laughs> the, th the theme of the, uh, of the event is the science behind healing. And for us, what we were trying to say there is, you know, all these wonderful things are happening, and they're clearly happening, but now is time more than ever to take scientific actions towards solidifying these things into hard rock science. And I know you've done a lot of science uh, behind your work with reconnective healing. And uh, uh, many of you in, in this panel have, have done the same in your modality. So the question in this sense is really what's, um, what's, what is the science and what are these elements and how can we prove and say to other people, this is it and this is how it works. The reason, the reason my face looks confused is that I'm not really sure where to begin with that. Because <laughs> to do, no, 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 I mean, I mean seriously, I, I think to do a liturgy of the science that's supporting this might be a bit dry. How many people want to hear about the science supporting this, 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 and this? <laughs> no, really. <How> many, <laughs> Because I told you my opinion on the, on the research. My opinion on the research is that the results are the least important part of it. It's the fact that science is actually studying the work that allows for most people to remove their self-imposed blinders and say, well, if science is looking at it, I will look at it also. So... We've touched on a good amount of the science. Well, we've touched on some of the science yesterday. We talked about when the reconnective healing frequencies enter the room, according to Dr. William Tiller and Dr. Schwartz and Konstantin Karatkov and others, they've determined that the excess free energy in the room could not be reproduced without raising the actual temperature of the room to over 576 degrees Fahrenheit, 300 degrees Celsius. We've talked about at least approximately the six main studies showing that damaged DNA rapidly heals itself, not just from the scientifically laboratory-induced damage, but actually from pre-existing damage. There are studies that measure sound and light emitted from the hands 
that show that it functions at a more coherent level, a level beyond that which has been obtained, attained by master meditators. We've shown that the studies restructuring the DNA have changed the coherent level of light, which is why a lot of the researchers, what a lot of the researchers attribute the reconnective healings to, why they tend to be so fairly instantaneous, as you noticed yesterday, and how they tend to last for a lifetime. There have been studies where they've severed leaves from vines. Left alone, a leaf might live for a few days. With energy healing, the studies show that the leaves lived from seven to nine days. With reconnective healing, the studies show that the leaves lived from 70 to 90 days. What do you do with this information? There's more. Of course there's more. What is it that we do with it? That's what's most important. Uh, talking with Lynn McTaggart, when, when you look at, you know, who's not able to be here today, when you look at her book, The Field, she has gone into a lot of the quantum physics that strongly substantiates or brings, I should say, understanding as to why reconnective healing works so effectively. It's nice for us to know. It's nice for us not to even have to argue the science, but to turn around and say, you know, if, if you think there's no science on this, I'm terribly sorry that you are not up to date on the medical literature. If you're terminally left-brained and you're into research, as we said, you can get Konstantin Karakov's book on Amazon.com, Science Confirms Reconnective Healing. Oh, I'm about to say something that every little voice in the back of my head is telling me not to say. <laughs> Science bores the shit out of me. It really, really does. And um, I'm glad it's there for people who need it. But you know what? You know what? When you learn reconnective healing and you work with that first five-year-old child who had cerebral palsy or epilepsy, is plagued by 15 to two dozen seizures a day, or can't walk without holding on to furniture, can't open or move their hand, can't speak comprehensibly, on all these different meds at that age with all those chemicals and their side effects. And that child gets up and can walk, can run, can speak normally. The parents call and say, what did you do? No more seizures and they don't need any medications. The doctors call and say, what did you do? And I would say, I didn't do anything. And don't tell anybody. That's what I used to say. It didn't work. They told everyone, you know what? Thank goodness, because that's why you're here. I love science. I leave it to the scientists. But when you change a child's life, you don't just change them physically. You bring about emotional changes, they think about themselves differently, which allows them to think differently, do better in school and life, so they function on a different level, which removes the stress from the family relationship so the marriage becomes stronger, which in many cases turns one or both of the parents into reconnective healing practitioners, so like ripple effects, they affect other families. And you know what? One child or adult at a time we change the world. We don't need to go out and try to heal the world. The world is a reflection of us. When we work one-on-one, -on -one, the world changes because the world is a reflection of us. I know that's not your question, but that's my answer. Beautiful. <laughs> Dr. Fannin, please. Well, I'm glad that you like to let science be with the scientists. <laughs> You're gonna, and, and you're going to brain map me later, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And everybody can watch. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's his motto. 
everybody can watch because love is like pornography. <laughs> it's time to let that one go. I, I for one, am, is science has... <laughs> science has... Uh, been a very big part of my life and I remember as, as I was moving into this path and one of the hobbies that I got into early on was working with uh, people who are uh, telling me that they have different gifts to be clairvoyant to be psychic to be highly intuitive and I recall the, the very first one that I did and I was really curious I wanted to know how they use their brain differently than other people, or do they? You know, is there something that is unique about that ability? Because we'd hear all the time, you know, we all have those gifts, we all have those abilities. We, some people who have just a little more development. So the very first one that I did with somebody, and it kind of scared me a little bit, you know, it, not, not the brain map itself, but in our discussion afterwards, she said, your mission in life is to bridge science and spirituality. And at the time, not a lot of that was being done. And I'm going, oh, oh no, 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 not me. You know, that will ruin my career. There's no way I can talk about that. People will think I'm nuts. You know, science and spirituality, no, no way. Well, here I am. <laughs> up here on a panel of distinguished individuals. But, but the, the, the point is, the, the point being is that science is looking at these things because the time is right, the time is now. What science does is it doesn't, it doesn't alter what Dr. Pearl was saying. That, that is the purpose, that is the focus. What science does is it allows it to be okay for those of us that need that science and understanding to engage in this practice, to then say, oh, I'm not nuts or crazy, and the, uh, the rest of the world say, yeah, I kind of understand that. You know, it, it wasn't that long ago that you had mentioned the word quantum physics and, and people would run from you, but now a lot of people, they may not know exactly what it is, but they know it's important. And now we're moving into a new era, a new awakening, a new frontier where these kinds of things are not only possible to understand, but we have a responsibility to use them in our own way, in the modalities that each of us are perfecting and understanding, and, and to learn at least enough of the science that you can help other people who are not quite there, because it gives them permission to embrace the divine within themselves. And that's the important part of this so that we can use that power. Science has no power, it's just going to tell the story, that's all. Uh, I like to speak as a physician, a medical doctor, and it's, I'm in this uh, journey now, I don't want to say how many years, but more than 30 years. And uh, one time I think I wrote a blog on this, you know, there's no way, and listen at this, that modern medicine will welcome any, call it the way you want, complementary alternative health care without a, a solid scientific foundation on science. That will not happen. You know, I had to debate uh, you know, 30 years ago, I was already interested in alternative medicine, doing meditation. And already at that time, there was study. You know, I remember in meditation, we have a collect paper, you know, with research, uh, you know, how this alter uh, the, the brain wave and so on. Nobody was li looking at this. Everybody was smiling. Now we, as his, uh, Dr. Fanning said, there is a conjuncture because consciousness, collective consciousness build after years and after years, there's a momentum now where they start to look at what is happening in the field, in this field of quantum medicine. There's a window. Now, before people were smiling, but now, no, they start to take seriously this kind of research. So it's not a joke. We are speaking about a paradigm shift. You know, here we're preaching to the choir. 
We're not even a drop in the basket. But when we have to stand before medical board and before the, before the society and all the, you don't know how many how much money is invested now in pharmaceutical and this vision of the genetics we were speaking about. It's huge. You know when of course when we you know speak between us, you know it's an easy talk and everybody get in this you know space where we can heal with energy. But when you are out there, where ph pharmaceutical and all these you know, are in control of, of the industry of healthcare. This is another ball game. We're not joking here. That's real ball game. And you have to come with research and research all in all the way, in all the direction. This is why for me in the university, this is a, absolutely f an ax that will help alternative and complementary medicine to happen. That will not happen without that. Forget it. And I remember sitting, you know, before my colleague, my peer, with, with a legion of, of clients that I helped with this alternative. And I remember a guy uh, in whom he, he was supposed to get his uh, leg uh, uh, amputate, cut. And then with homeopathy, I, I wrote a blog on that. You know, we say, we say I, then I, as I said to Dr. Pearl, I said, don't speak about it. And other, we had case like that. And they would look at this like, oh, no, it's just... Uh, Random, it's you know this. It's uh, it's it's not it's it's not scientific again. So we need absolutely a hard core of 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 science, not only in studies because you have to realize homeopathy. We have research for probably fifty years that it works, but we need to have, and this is where come the university because in university this is where paradigm shift. This is where we start to teach this new principle you know, of reality. We need a foundation to grasp what before the linear model of, of physics could not understand. A and this has been the work of Dr. Goswami in our university to lay out the foundation of that. Because you can make experiment, but if, if along doesn't come the model of science to explain that, you better forget it because they still don't understand how work vital force, and they don't understand southern energy. And they don't. We have to create a language where the conventional standard medical world can communicate with you know, this uh, other way of looking at reality. And, and this is, you know, most of the time happen where you, you put together a faculty, people that has published and written and create a new language to communicate with science. So this is how important it is for me. When you say science behind what we are doing, it's one of the major acts. And, and I think, of course, it's not the, probably the most exciting part because you have to decorticate, analyze, as, as I said yesterday. It's like, you know, the other part of the brain that is working. And then when you are in the, your mode of healing, then you have to forget everything like an artist, you know, playing piano. He forget about, you know, the hours of practice and and studying and constant, he just, and then he get in this space where, what, where doc, uh, what uh, described Dr. Pearl. But that's, this is the, the love we were speaking about. It's the passion to understand, learn, explain to others, communicate with others what we have in, in our uh, heart and ex experience. Thank you very much. Continuing in the same vein, <laughs> <laughs> the uh, utmost important thing that we have to recognize today is that machines and human beings are different. We have to assert it constantly whenever we get the opportunity. We have, through physics and chemistry, uh, developed very good models that work for machines. And those models are incomplete for the treatment of the human being. It's pretty obvious. Even the strongest of scientists, who is the strongest of a believer in scientific materialism, everything is matter, doesn't really believe that everything is matter because our experiences don't fit that model. There is a lot of fear to give up the control that that model brings in the world of science and technology, and that there's a lot of money involved. All true, 
we have to recognize the reluctance, the inertia, we have to be patient, all true. But for those of us who can, and this is the way changes happen. Um, this is probably you know, not the best time to quote uh, spiritual uh, work, but you know, spiritual books, they always say, those who can hear, let them hear. This is not true just of spirituality, it's true of also science. Any changes come with people who can hear. 400 years ago, Newton, Galileo, those guys exactly were in the same position as we are in today. The problem arises when people who can hear, they also start having differences in opinion. And this causes more of a problem than the opponents. The opponents cannot hear. But people who can hear, for them to have these kind of uh, differences, which says the extreme view, which is the, basically the spiritual view, that no, you can never build the science of experience. It will take away the mystery or some other reason that it take away the miracle that is the human being or whatever way you put it. But the idea is that basically it's a hopeless task because the word science just doesn't apply. This is the wrong approach, I feel, because this division among people who are open to the fact that although the machine sciences work very well for machines, it does not work very well for us, this should be made a starting point for a new science of is there a scientific approach to what we have. In other words, can we combine subjective and objective in science? This is the whole issue. Quantum physics from the beginning is saying that yes, not only you can, you must. Because even in the study of submicroscopic objects of the material world, we find that consciousness somehow gets in. Without consciousness, we cannot understand the behavior of even the submicroscopic world of matter. And then it's just a simple generalization from the idea that consciousness has to be the basis of all sciences. There's just no question that as soon as you have done that, then we can make a science of experience. Just simply by using our intelligence, which suggests that these ideas that we are talking about, the new experiences that we are talking about, mental and vital, even the intuitional, they are all sharing one thing with submicroscopic matter. Namely, their behavior is very quantum. It's a, it's, a, it's a very easy behavior to detect today in view of our experimental savvy. We can test out certain things. Non-locality, signalless communication is the major one. That not only establishes that consciousness is the ground of being, there is a field of non-locality. No, no sane scientist can deny it. So in the same sense, if we find non-locality to be the uh, capacity of the vital, the living world, and a few other quantum properties, non-locality is the easiest one to understand, so I'll stick with that one. Then we already know that, yes, this is quantum. We can put in, because there is no other way of including non-locality, by the way, that we know of. Any other way is hand-waving. That's not the way we do science. If there is already a science which is doing it, use that science, see how far you can go. So we make the simple hypothesis that in the quantum world, we can include the human experience. Once we do that, we get absolutely amazing answers to our healing sciences. All the alternative, including conventional medicine as well, fits together. It can be integrated which is the subject of, which is the subject and object of our university, which is literally giving you that system that can be developed. And we find that enormous amount of work, empirical work already exists in the realm of medicine to support this view. In other words, science never was this discontinuous 
thing. Science has always been this very continuous thing within consciousness. It's the hundred years or so of scientific materialism that gives us the wrong connotation of science that we must not call that we must not call what the ancients did about traditional Chinese medicine is not science, that we must not call homeopathy a science because it talked about experience somewhat differently than machines. Uh, this prejudice, if we give up, and if we accept the fact that quantum physics is the only physics right now that gives you a science of experience, so let's explore it. That's how science works. If some, something else comes around in the future, which I don't think it can, because this is a very unique property that quantum physics has, um, but we keep open. We keep that option open. We never say that science of today is the final word. We don't need to say that. Then uh, let's proceed. And as soon as you have done that, we recognize that we have not lost anything because it includes the old completely. Any advances of the conventional medicine will be happily endorsed by any of us in integrative medicine, any of us working here. Why is the opposition of the other side? And especially, why is the opposition of the side of people that says that, no, we don't like this because science doesn't apply to human experiences? Why that narrow view? I hear so many people who, just simply from a purist point of view, reject the advent of the new science. Purist meaning that, no, the ontology that we believe must be separate from the scientific ontology. It must exclude the conventional objective science. Why the exclusion? That is also part of the human experience. So if you can include everything, then why not include everything? It's just a simple matter of definition of what a dogma is. A dogma is that which excludes, leaves out. When we have a dogma-free science, when quantum physics is creating that opportunity of finally developing a dogma-free science, finally developing an inclusive science, why should we have any doubt about exploring it for a while, endorsing it just to the, just to until uh, experimentally, empirically, there is some discrepancy. There has not been any so far. We have about 30 years of experiencing things with the quantum ideas. Not one exception has shown up to the quantum way of thinking. Not one. 30 years are quite a long time. So we can proceed. Thank you. I honestly think that science is the contemporary language of mysticism. I think that the moment you start talking about tradition or culture or religion or any scriptures, you're going to divide an audience. And that when mystics and masters in the past spoke of being able to quantify their miraculous events, they used the language of the time to be able to say, Whatever it was, in my father's house, there's many mansions, you know, the quantum field has infinite possibilities. Whatever they were trying to explain to the masses was to help them wrap their mind around what was possible. And I think that science is that language right now. Now, I question research more than ever at this time in history because I feel like true research is commingled with profits. And I have difficulty in surrendering to the conditioning that most of us don't even know we're part of. And that most people, the moment they have a headache, the first thing they think of is to take an aspirin. Why did you choose that? So you think that you have free will, or most people think that they have free will. But that's not free will. They're making a choice based on knowns. 
Free will is making a choice based on the unknown. That's true free will. So the fact that 38 research papers are published and <clears throat> if there are adverse effects on that medication and the research papers are going for a peer review, you know that half of them will still be published even if the results show there's a negative effect on the drug. You don't know that, but now you're conditioned through advertising that to take this drug and it's going to do this, but don't worry, you know, you're going to have hair loss, loss of libido, loss of appetite, and, you know, your teeth are going to fall out, but look at the guy on the camera, he's smiling, it's got to be working for you. <laughs> and so I'm insulted by that because most people pay no attention to the message, they're too seduced by an image. And this is a time in history where people are beginning to wake up. You know, this is, in the age of information, ignorance is a choice. And because enough people are beginning to wake up to the facts about the way things really are, because the economic model and the political model and the religious model and the medical model and the educational model and the environment, all of those paradigms are beginning to collapse. And they're collapsing for a specific reason, is because the consciousness that built those paradigms has been built on those survival emotions of competition, of greed, of deception, of lies, because that's the selfish consciousness that put it all into place. So when people hear that Baxter Labs is putting the very active antigen, uh, the, anti the antigen into their um, vaccines to create the condition, and nobody's stirred by that, I'm really stirred by that, because people are like, oh, change the channel, let's see, what's pl let's see Dancing with the Stars. It didn't, it didn't land for them. But there's enough discomfort going on in the world right now that you reach a point where you can't go on business as usual. And unfortunately, that's human nature. So using science to be able to measure the effects of the quantum gives you permission to do the same. In other words, in the Newtonian model of reality where there's linear, linear sequential events that take place, A plus B plus C plus D, the, you know, that kind of linear processing that goes on, the cause and effect model, isn't really how biology works. There's an intercommunication that's taking place between cells that are happening faster than the speed of light. If it's happening faster than the speed of light, then it's happening in the quantum and you are a quantum expression of that. So then, most people's understanding about health, you can't even explain how a cut heals anymore without bringing in the vitalistic quantum model of reality. That molecules and hardware and receptors, that's just crap, it's just not the way it is. But that model still stands today because it's endorsed by a medical profession that's living in a fear-based principle that they could face malpractice and they got to do all these things and get all this validation. And it's a, it's, they're subscribing to a, to a, um, to a conditioning, to a, a belief system that isn't the truth. Now, someone's got to tell the story. And telling the story means then that quantum says that consciousness or your subjective mind has an effect on the objective world. But because Newtonian's model is based on matter and materialism and predictability, there's no mind involved in it, so it's safe to predict all these things. But if subjective mind has an effect on objective reality, then the measurement is only as good as the practitioner. It's the bottom line. And whether Eric, Dr. Pearl, likes it or not, he has a skill that he's developed over time, and we're measuring the effects of his skill. And because you heard there were epigenetic changes, and you heard that people had all these changes, you accept that it's possible subconsciously. You're being reconditioned right in that moment to see that if he's able to do it or other practitioners are able to do it, it means that you're able to do it as well. Would you agree? And when that person announces in your family that they have a headache, you may not choose an aspirin. You may choose to do some type of coherent healing on them. Or you may choose to say, what's going on emotionally for you? Or let's sit down for a moment and change our breathing patterns. Let's change our physiology. And so people only do the best 
with what they know is available. If the placebo effect works on depressed patients 80% of the time, three out of four people get better by taking a sugar pill because they expect a new outcome. They're selecting a potential in the quantum field. They're emotionally embracing that potential and they're no longer choosing the same scenario. That's quantum physics. And their body's responding to a new mind. Consciousness is changing biology in that moment. And some of those changes are permanent. So then, if the placebo can work that well, and they can do a brain scan on a woman who thought she was taking the drug for three months, and the brain scan shows that it wasn't in her mind. It was in her brain. The question then is, do you need the sugar pill? Do you need the saline injection? Do you need the procedure? Or can you just move into a state of being because you can put your faith in the unknown into possibility and make that unknown known? Now we're talking about troubadours and leaders. And those are the people that I want to hang out with because this is a time in history where you and I have to shine across the board. And that when you walk in and you're a practitioner and you walk into that room, you have no idea the amount of faith someone puts in you. And if you walk in there and you're more matter and less than less energy and less energy, you are matter trying to change matter and you will rely on chemicals and drugs because you have no effect on the, the space that you're commanding. But if you're removing the layers of those limitations within you, and you're changing yourself to allow the field to move through you, to express itself through you, and that field is loving intelligence and intelligent love, that's it. It's consciousness and energy. And that consciousness and energy is what allows people to truly transform. And we call that getting out of the way or getting beyond your analytical mind or being in the flow, whatever you want to call it. All of a sudden, your thinking neocortex has to get out of the way for some higher centers to begin to process information through you. And so, those three brains that we have allow us to go from thinking to doing to being. All of this knowledge that you're learning here in the form of science, which is the language of mysticism as far as I'm concerned, to measure the effects of consciousness that's related to your ability to execute it. All of this knowledge is stored in your thinking neocortex. And you'll contemplate it and you'll analyze it and you should because you're wiring that information in the architect. But when you take that knowledge and you personalize it, you demonstrate it, you do something with it, you modify your behavior, you're going to have a new experience. And when you have that new experience, you're going to activate that second brain called the limbic brain the emotional brain, the chemical brain. And if you can get your behaviors to match your intentions, get your actions equal to your thoughts, use the philosophy, the science or whatever as a precursor for the experience, and you align mind and body, when that new experience happens, it's gonna reinforce the circuits in your brain and you're gonna produce an emotional quotient. And that emotional quotient, you're gonna begin to embody this information. It's no longer philosophical. Your body is now taking it, the words becoming flesh, and you're signaling new genes in new ways, and you're beginning to rewrite the program. But listen, I know this just from studying it so many times, it's not enough to do it once. You gotta be able to repeat the experience, and you gotta be able to do it over and over and over again. You have to do it so many times that you neurochemically condition your body to memorize how to do it as well as your conscious mind. Now it's innate in you. It's second nature. It's easy, it's familiar, it's automatic. As a matter of fact, you don't even think about doing it because you've practiced it so many times, it's who you are. And when you activate that third brain called the cerebellum, the seat of your subconscious mind, you're out of the way. You have an intention and your body does it for you automatically. And so getting people to go from thinking to doing sometimes is just like herding cats because everybody loves to stay in that intellectual realm. But you're doers. But what makes it scientific is rep re repetition, being able to repeat it. And if you begin to say 
that you understand consciousness and you understand that there's orthomolecular changes from nutrition and you begin to recite the facts and the knowledge, by you educating the masses, you're giving them other choices. And so I'm very passionate about measuring the effects of consciousness because it gives people permission to begin to be informed about the truth about the way things are. And universities like this, and Paul's effort to make it something that's practical and easy, is just the beginning because people around the world are waking up and they want to know the truth. And so uh, medicine works so well for acute conditions. If I break my arm, I'm going to go to the medical doctor and I'm going to get my arm taken care of. Why? Because acute care really falls under the paradigm of, of medicine. But when you look at chronic care, eh, you don't really, they don't really want to deal with chronic care because they're, you're a problem. Get out of here. Just take this drug and get out. Get out and I'll see you in six months. And, well, you know, and if it doesn't work, then, you know, and, and you're still in pain, it could be in your head. Yeah. Well, it's always been there, right? <laughs> so I'm saying this because you step out into the jungle. This is the, this, this is the laws of the jungle. These are the laws of the jungle. But with chronic care, there's a place for you to intervene and see the body as a vitalistic level of expression of energy and to be able, be able to influence it on as many fronts as possible to restore normal homeostasis and to define meaning behind what people are doing. The more they know what they're doing, the more they understand why, the more consciousness they have behind it, and the better the effects that they get. And so to educate and to give people information, however you choose to do it, is the precursor for them to begin to have another experience. And I say in my office when I'm in there, and I tell this to my staff, everybody gets better today. And nobody walks out of here feeling the same way as they walked in. And if you're able to influence a person on that level, they will begin to look forward to seeing you in your clinic. And if 29% of people can get nauseous and another 11% of people can throw up on their drive to their first chemotherapy treatment without having the chemotherapy treatment. But the doctor told them they're going to get sick from chemotherapy. They get sick on their drive over to their first chemotherapy treatment. Then 50% of the people can get well on their drive to your office. Thanks. <laughs> Beautiful. All right. I have one final answer, and since we have 15 minutes left, we will do this a speed round of about three, mi uh, three minutes each. And um, it, what I wanted to acknowledge today was that today is Mahatma Gandhi's birthday. And it, well, actually, what a beautiful day to have graduation and to have this event. Uh, because, you know, everybody knows the quote, you must be the change you wish to see in the world. And so with that said, I would like to know what is, what is next for you? What are you looking at? What is your thing that you are going to change in the world? And that so we can go in the direction that you, the leaders, are going into. Please, Dr. Pearl. Three minutes. <laughs> Sorry. I'm, going to give you, I'm going to give you an even shorter answer to your question than you had in mind, because I want to add one thing, which is, you know, the importance of science to me is that it opens doors. Everything exists before science discovers it. Um, what makes science, as Joe said, what makes it scientific is its reproducibility. And when you're doing reconnective healing, you see the consistent reproducibility in what comes about. What Dr. Goswami said is that science has always been continuous in the last hundred years of scientific materialism. It's been discontinuous. That's true. We unfortunately have been confusing absence of proof with proof of absence. The child of the family, the family of the child who has a healing doesn't care whether there's research, but the next child might be helped because of it. Yes, it's not my focus. No, do not confuse that with thinking that I'm saying that it is not important. Where do I want to go in the world? Where is this world going? As I said yesterday, I hope we are 
quickly, rapidly approaching the point in time when a young child will look up at their parents and say, really? Did people really used to swallow poisons to try to get healthy? I think that it's time today also for us to stop putting blind faith in drugs and medicine, but it's been time for that for a long time. On the opposite, I think it's really time for us to stop thinking that there's one any special healer living in a mountaintop in Tibet that we need to go travel to, that it's time for us to become that healer, period. And I hope I didn't go past my three minutes. We live in a marvelous time and age. It's a great time to be living. It's a great time to be doing what we do. With the technology that is available, uh, one of the things in, in my profession, you've seen us demonstrating the brain mapping over here. And we are now working on how to get that to the masses. How do we get information and technology available uh, at a low cost and at a, a, a function where people can begin to make these uh, changes in their own brain uh, easily and affordably. And so we, we have some new technology that is available that we're working on to make that uh, become a reality, and we're just a few months away from it. We've been working on this for uh, several years now, and uh, we're just a few months away from being able to make that more available where you can do your brain training and brain mapping off of your smartphone. Uh, anywhere in the world, anytime, in a wireless condition. So for us, that is the future. It is how to bring the elements of quantum physics into a real process where you as an individual can begin to make that transformational change and take that responsibility yourself to make that change and then to help heal others. And to take and, and to be better than you are and to be worthy of who you really are. And take that out into the world. Uh, we were speaking about love, and I said, uh, you know, when I was seeing a, a client or a patient, it was like opening a book, a love story. And tonight is uh, the graduation. and. It's, uh, it's to pursue that love story because when I see this uh, student graduating and the, the, the path they went through and, and, and most many times I read their uh, paper and thesis and I, I saw how they have evolved and you know, now they can use this new language that we are th teaching and they are committed in their, their, their way to, uh, to express this model of healing. For me, uh, this is just pursuing that that uh, that path of uh, because it's from one love story to another love story to bond with the you uh, you know and to see you every year coming back and you know bonding together as express uh, Lynn McTaggart and it's very rewarding it's 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 a true experience of love to see this and to witness that and thank you very much everybody to to make this uh, possible because it's not you know, it's an entanglement. It cannot happen. It, ha it has to happen, you know, the, uh, both sides. Thank you very much. Truly, what you were seeing here and hearing here and what's happening with you is really the rebirthing of a science in the search of the heart. For a long time, we have done science uh, in a quiet, head-centered way, very rational, very logical, very linear. But we were, of course, quite aware, thanks to our women folks, especially, that we have a being which is based on love. And uh, this Angelina Jolie uh, case, you know, I was very moved by it because I like her acting. I don't know. I like her being ambassador to uh, for United Nations and taking care of children. I don't know what it was, but I was very moved by the case. 
Um, it just so happened that around that same time, I was working with a uh, Chinese medicine practitioner on uh, writing uh, something about breast cancer. So the confluence of it, uh, and especially what this Chinese medicine man was teaching me, in the sense that for healing breast cancer in the traditional Chinese medicine, what is very important is to take care of your liver and your stomach, which are two um, organs of the gastrointestinal system, uh, what we call the navel chakra. So one of, the, one of the findings of the new science is that in order to have a self, you need a um, uh, combination of apparatuses in the system which has a logical circularity which means illogic got to be built into the uh, system itself so that it can perform that illogical function of how to bring subjectivity into an otherwise objective dynamic. So I was, you know, it's easy to see that in the living cell, it's easy to see that in the brain, but it's very difficult to see it uh, in the heart. But of course, heart is not heart. Heart is the immune system more like it because it's the immune system function that's more connected with love. Uh, still, tangled hierarchy, this concept of circularity is very hard to see. But this idea that, that stomach and liver are important made uh, the breakthrough. And I could now see, using some of the same ideas that ancient Chinese uh, played with, namely that the vital component corresponding to the organs, they always have this relationship through the meridians. And these relationships have two aspects. One is control, one is support. And then you can make a tangled hierarchy involving both the organs of the heart chakra and the organs of the navel chakra. What emerges then is that you can get a tangled hierarchy, a circular hierarchy, if you include the immunogastrointestinal system. Now, you know, when, when, when people talk about um, psychoneurogastrointestinal uh, <laughs> um, they do connect the immune system and the gastrointestinal system. The, the, the point is that we have known that for a while, that there is a connection between the self-centered about the brain and the self-centered about this immunogastrointestinal system. And there is even some independent evidence that these uh, um, organs in the body, they really are like a second center of the self. In, in uh, medicinal systems, they don't go as far as recognizing self-preference but they do recognize that, that there is uh, some autonomy. In other words, they recognize that something in the body that is like a self-autonomic system, like something in the brain that is an autonomic system. So in this way, um, the breakthrough came to me that there really is a center or a self associated with the body, centered around the heart. And this is the center that popular wisdom, uh, popular spiritual wisdom, scientific wisdom in our new version of the history of science that we are creating, uh, has always recognized. Uh, this is where uh, ideas like spirituality is a search for the heart, uh, those ideas came from. So I think that um, the, uh, focus that makes us very, very different at this university and others of similar ilk is this recognition. Finally, we are ready to build a science which will also completely recognize love, completely recognize hurt as a center of our being. And, and in that, doing that, completely become inclusive of both the rational aspect and the non-rational aspect of ourselves, and we'll all be better for it. Uh, I'm, I'm the uh, happiest when I'm learning and when I'm changing and when I'm contributing. 
And um, I have witnessed transformation uh, since probably 1998 in seeing people from all over the world have breakthroughs and change their state of being. And whether I'm in Japan or China or in South America or in Canada, transformation looks exactly the same on every person. It transcends culture. And when people truly transform their energy and they begin to process higher frequencies or higher energy, whatever you want to call that, you know, your nervous system is the superconductor of consciousness. And when your nervous system is translating that frequency through the body, you're experiencing love. And when I have observed it over the years, it's very infectious because love tends to unify. It tends to develop community. And, it, and no organism in nature really survives in competition. They won't. They so survive in cooperation. And so this concept in, in biology has always intrigued me. It's called emergence. And emergence, you ever see the fish, they all turn at the same time? Or the birds, they all swim and they all move it the same way? Or neurons exactly do the same thing. And when you study that, <clears throat> you tend to think that there's a leader like it's a top-down phenomenon. Turns out there's no leader, it's a bottom-up phenomenon. In other words, there's a collective consciousness amongst that community where they're sharing information and they're all behaving in the exact same way and they're creating a oneness or the appearance of oneness. And it's my passion, and it has been my passion in the last few years, uh, to transform individuals in order to transform a culture. And then if enough people begin to not only embrace these things intellectually, but live them, that new communities will begin to pop up and will consume the old communities. And the stigma that we have on Gandhi's birthday in our minds subconsciously is that every leader gets it. Every leader gets shot, whether he's a, he or she is you know, Gandhi or Martin Luther King or Joan of Arc, they all got it in the end and subconsciously that's in there for us to not lead and not shine too much. But if everybody is a leader and there's an emergence coming out and individuals are all sharing the same consciousness called love and they're unifying and they're taking care of each other, that emergence of a new consciousness is what allows the species to begin to evolve. And so that's my ambition and that's my passion. Thanks. Listen, we're, we're here to bring you the information that we would like to bring you, but we're also here to bring you the information that you desire. I have eight more hours that I'll be recording of teaching. If you have topics that you feel should be covered in those eight hours because it's your curiosity, please feel free to email us, let us know, and we will weave this in because this learning experience cannot be a one-way thing. Okay, so thank you. I just want to say that, uh, am I? Where's your mic? Ooh, that's me. <laughs> you know, oh, put it down. I just, um, I just wanted to say that I, like I said at the beginning, I, I've been thinking about this exact moment for a year. And uh, it has exceeded all my expectations. And... Uh, And, and for those people that, that, that think, oh, how, does, how do you turn intention into manifestation, this is it. And in fact, this entire event is it. And so I wanted to thank all of you for being co-creators with us in this wonderful happening. And so please give a big round of applause for the Dream Team. Thank you so much, and let's have some lunch, and we will see you in about two hours. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.